Okay, now we're recording. Yay, thank you for doing that, saying that. Okay. Okay, so making a go, no go decision. So the best way to do this is to find the opportunity and find the scope of work right away. So find the scope of work, or sometimes it's called performance work statement, um, might be called specifications, and you need to read it. These, you know, that is going to really help you make a, a decision on whether you can do it. You know, um, you, you, can you do the work? Have you done similar work like that in the past? Um, those are some things to think about. Um, you know, what, what um, is the deadline for, for the opportunity? So when you're in SAM, you know, you can see that, um, you know, you can see that on the posting in SAM. So do you even have enough time to respond? That's the biggest question. Because when it comes to the RFP process, it's a long process and it's going to take you a long time to, to put it together. So that's really something to think about there. Um, is your business capable of executing the scope of work? So there's lots of things to think about here. You know, how much of the project, um, you know, can you, can you do it yourself? Are you going to sub out some of it? Um, how much is your business going to do versus your subcontractors? Um, you know, do you, do you have subs lined up already? If you, if, if you don't, you know, that, that alone takes time. That alone takes time to define the subcontractors, to get pricing from them. And, you know, depending on what the deadline is, if you don't have some of that, um, some, you know, subs already lined up, that's just going to eat into the time it takes to put your proposal together. So these are some things to be thinking about to decide whether you want to even proceed. What is the probability that your company will win? Um, you know, do you, do you have the, some past performance experience um, in doing the type of work that's in the scope of work? Um, that will increase your probability. Um, do you, you know, how do you compare to your competition that uh, other people that may be bidding on the same project? You know, have they have they done it? Be, have they done that type of work before, and you haven't? You know, where, where do you think you'll rank in the whole scheme of things if you were to, if you were to submit an offer? Is there an incumbent? So is this a, is this a contract that is um, currently being, you know, being held or held by another company? Are you, do you have the ability to unseat them? That can be really hard. Uh, that can be challenging to unseat an incumbent. So, you know, what, how do you compare to them? You, you want to do some research on them and your competition to see, well, how, how do we currently compare to this other company, okay? You know, another thing to think about is, is it worth the time? Is it worth the time to, to put, in, put in an offer? Do you have the time to put together the offer? You know, do you have the time in your schedule to do the work? Even if you do, is it going to be worth it? What's, you know, what's the risk versus the reward? Are you going to... Are you, is it pencil for you? Are you going to be able to make a profit or at least make your, um, you know, your profit goal on this job? So those are just some things to think about before, uh, before you proceed. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to look at, to show you is the uniform contract format. So this is the format that is used for negotiated RFPs. Negotiated RFPs are the process is outlined in FAR Part 15, okay? So if you ever want to know the, pro the process involved that the agency uses, FAR Part 15 is where you would find that. And so what it does is the uniform contract format organizes the solicitation into these specific sections that I have a screenshot of here. And it helps because once you get familiar with this format, then it makes it easy to, you know, jump back and forth between sections, you know, oh, oh, that's, you know, the instructions are, you know, are in section L. So I'm just, I'm going to go to section L right away and, and read about what I need to do um, to submit my offer. So that's just really helpful to understand that these are all organized in the same way. Okay. Um, you know, there's different, I'm, I'm not going to get into the different standard forms. Um, we will look at one standard form, um, which is in section A, which I think today it's a 1442, but you may see some other standard forms used. Um, you just need to make sure that you fill those out, um, you know, the right sections per what the agency asks you to do. So, 
Uh, so before we get into the actual review of the RFP, this is a question that we get a lot is if there's a template that I can use to make my RFP. The answer really is no, <laughs> not really. There isn't like a template out online that you can download and fill in, fill in the blanks. It's what you're doing is you're using the instructions in the solicitation as your template. So you're going to use their wording and their headings and subheadings. And I'll show you what I mean when we get into it um, to format your template for the solicit for the RFP. Okay. Uh, in, in the documents that I put in the Dropbox, I gave you some of these guide sheets. It's um, from a company. I watched a training by this company a while back um, on proposal writing. And I just really thought that her guide sheets were really good and helped you you know, would help a business get them thinking about the information that they need to put into the RFP. So if you've never, if you've never written a proposal, or maybe you're iffy, or not very confident in your writing skills, I think these guide sheets will help, you know, help you extract that information from your brain. And then you can take that information from the guide sheets to, um, you know, to write the proposal. So that would be the goal for the use of those sheets. Okay. We're not going to go over those guide sheets. Those are really for your information. Uh, you know, another tip is, you know, once you once you have an RFP written, so once you once you submit one or get one together for the first time, now you kind of have a template really um, to save it, and you can use that as a general guideline for future RFPs. Obviously, you're going to have to tailor it to whatever the agent, you know, whatever agency you're dealing with and what their requirements and instructions are, but. That'll give you a good base, you know, and, you know, if you, if you submit an RFP in the future and it, you, you don't get, you don't win the award, um, you know, we definitely encourage you to request a debrief from the agency so that you can get some feedback on where you were deficient in your RFP, and then you know where you can make changes later on, so. So this, um, so that are, those are some good tips for as far as template and, you know, putting putting this together um, for now and in the future. So, okay, so let's, I'm just gonna move my slides over. And I have a lot of attachments open. I have all the attachments open, so it'll, my PDF is a little slow, but um, if you guys wanna follow along with me, you guys should have the same document, okay? and. We're just going to go over the highlighted sections and and my notes in here and this is obviously you have this to refer back to um, another time this is actually a current solicitation i think it's due pretty soon i can't remember i have to we'll we'll see the due date in here but um so this first page is your standard form okay in this case it's a 1442 which is used for construction this is a construction project and um, you can see my notes over here. A lot of times a standard form you'll turn in with your offer, even with a request for quote, it'll be your cover page. Um, and you know the agency will tell you to fill it out, fill out these sections, sign it, it's pretty simple. Um, in this case, they don't want this as a, as a cover page, but they do want you to include it in, in one of the volumes with your offer, which we're gonna, once we get to the instructions, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Some of the, so these are just some areas to take note of. Your solicitation numbers are always at the top. Um, you can see that the it's negotiated RFP, which is check marks, and you know that FAR, FAR Part 15 is going to be involved, and the uniform contract format is going to be involved. Here's um, you know a contact information here. Stacy Valley is the contract specialist in this case, and here's her phone number. Um, her information is stated throughout the solicitation a couple of times that you'll so you'll see that. Type of contract, I really like this. It says it right away. Sometimes this information gets buried in here, but it's really nice that this one's on the front page. Uh, firm fixed price um, is just one type of contract type that's out there. Their um, contract types are found under FAR um, Part 16, so you can read more about what this means. I've provided links to, um, to, to the sections in the FAR, so you can read more about this. This one is set aside for small business. So if you are small in the NAICS code here in this NAICS code, then you are eligible to bid on this opportunity. 
the magnitude, this is the range, the anticipated um, value of, of the contract. So this is the range that their uh, agency is, is thinking of because the agency does their own market research ahead of time to, they already have an idea of what this project is supposed to cost, is supposed to cost them. So that's where they're getting this number because they're doing their own research ahead of time, okay? Size standard with this, this is corresponding to this NAICS code. So your average five-year revenue per your SAM registration, um, that you, hopefully, that, hopefully that number is correct. Your average five-year revenue for the entity that's applying for this opportunity plus any of your affiliated entities um, needs to be 39 and a half million or less to be considered small, okay? Let's see, um, they have information about questions and how they're submitted. So these need to be submitted to the contract specialist. Um, she says no later than five days before the close date. So if you have questions, you need to make sure and submit them to her in a timely manner because she's gonna take all those questions and you'll see them on one of the attachments and you know put them together and submit the answers to those as an amendment to the solicitation. Uh, so that everybody has a fair opportunity to get that information. So um, she needs you, to, you have to do that in a timely manner. Um, this information um, is regurgitated later on, but you know, this is telling you when you are expected to um, complete the work and when you're expected to start the work. So this is 10 days um, after you get a notice to proceed from the government. And they're saying that they that you need to be done within 594 days of notice to proceed. So let's see. Um, sealed offers and it says one copy is due by um, 1300 local time. So these are due on the 24th. So there's your due date right there. There is an offer guarantee that is required, and that you'll see that later on too. There is a bid guarantee that's due due with this particular offer. And the second page is where you'll actually fill out your information. So here you're going to put in your company's name, address, and your DUNS number, telephone number, uh, a mailing address if it's different than this address over here. Um, section or block 17, it's up to you if you fill it out, but this is just wants you to put in how many days your offer is good for. It has to be equal to or greater than, um, in this case, 90 days. If you don't put anything in there, then they just go with the 90 days. This block here on this particular form would be a lump sum price from your pricing schedule that we'll see in just a minute. So you would put your lump sum pricing here. This is where you acknowledge all the amendments and there are amendments in this, in this in this solicitation. So you put the amendment number, the date that it was issued. Um, this is a way you acknowledge it. That's a requirement for, for submitting your offers is to, is to acknowledge all the amendments. And here's where you sign your offer and print, and, and print your name and title here and the date. So last part, this is all to be completed by the government. So you don't have to worry about that. There is a third page which has the item numbers that are also on the same that's on the bid schedule, which we will look at in just a second. I always, even though it's not necessarily a requirement in this case, I still recommend that clients, you know, transpose their pricing onto this document too. So, because you are going to turn it in. And all right, so keep going. You can see a lot of the same information has already been, we've already gone through it. You've got your contract specialist information here and the contracting officer. There's so there's two contracts. This next, um, so now we're on. So section A is the is is your standard form. So now we're in section B, and this is your um, the supplies or services. So this is all again laid out in the uniform contract format. You will turn this form in with your offer. So this will have to be filled out. And they have each of the item numbers here for each of the, um, each part of the project um, that you have to offer a price on. I highlighted this because it's, it's a, the agency says your firm shall, meaning you're required to, <laughs> submit prices for all items 
that are fully burdened, okay? And this is really, really important to, to do this, okay? So you really need to make sure that you have a handle on your cost structure and that you are you are telling them the, the fully burdened rate, okay? So if you don't have a handle on your cost structure, then you may need to consult with a CPA to, to help you get some of that in order, okay? Deanna, do you have anything to say about that? I know that's a hot button sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just like, you know, over the years working with so many companies, I guess that's, this is one of the weakest links in all companies, uh, federal contracting or not. And so, um, you know, there's there's just hidden costs that sometimes don't get calculated into the, the estimates when you bid on a job that uh, really should be in there. And just from a managerial standpoint, I suppose, I think that all companies should really examine this and get professional help and then not rely on non-professionals. I mean, I would say, you know, make sure you're working with a CPA, make sure they've examined your your accounting system, make sure you're set up to, you know, especially construction companies to, um, you know, track jobs by the job and, and, and so you know where you're at on any particular job. So it gets, you know, a bit involved. You might have to spend some money to get the right help, but it, it'll pay off in the end because you won't, you won't underbid and lose money. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's just so many small details in here that you really, you know, that you, you won't know unless you read everything in detail. Like you need to read every page of the solicitation. So, you know, here's, here's an example. Items one and two shall be completed, accepted, and in service no later than November 7th. So, you know, they actually want you to do these first two items before, you know, first, <laughs> and then you have to do the others. So, it, you just have to really pay attention to the details in, in these solicitations. Here, you'll put your lump sum, so you'll add, it up, add up all your extended pricing and, and put that in here. Section C's description um, and specifications, they didn't include anything here because it is, it's an extra attachment. So uh, let's see, I think it's this one. Yeah, so they they um, provided a separate attachment and download for all the specifications. And I mean, there's 572 pages. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> I don't know about you, but that scares me. But yeah, in this situation, there's a lot. So, you know, that's why it's really important to, you know, you're, you need to be getting notice of these opportunities and, uh, you know, you need to be able to read all of this in enough time to respond. This document alone would take you a really a long time to read. So, um, I am going to close that because some of these documents make my PDF go slow. So, packaging and marking, you know, this one, this is blank. They, it's not, it's not needed for this solicitation. There's other other solicitations where this would apply, but in this case, it's not, it's not applicable. It might include like shipping information, like where you need to send something to, you know, how they want you to market that, you know, that's, that's what would usually be in this section if it was, if it was applicable. Section E, inspection and, inspect, and in acceptance, um, it has some FAR clauses that are here um, by reference. So, you know, you won't need to, they're, they're in here by reference because they are applicable to the solicitation. So you, you do need to, you know, understand what these mean and how, you know, how that applies to this solicitation. I, you know, you can find a copy of the FAR and on acquisition.gov. So I've included that link here. And this, for this particular opportunity, they talk about, you know, what's gonna, what needs to happen on final inspection. So you just need to be aware of that. More clauses are in section F. Um, I wanted to point this out because this is actually a discrepancy. So the first page on the you'll you'll remember on the standard form it said I think 594 days the work need to be completed. This one this part says 400 days. So you will if you read these in detail you'll see sometimes there are discrepancies. So this would be something I would I would just bring up to the contracting officer just to double check. Um, so that I would bring that up to Stacy. 
it's probably not a huge deal, but she should still know because they copy and paste some of this stuff and it, it could have, this could have been on a different solicitation and they, it didn't get changed. Contract work hours, you know, this is pretty normal stuff, federal holidays when you don't, you know, you don't need to be, you're not going to be in the park working, that sort of thing. Um, section G is um, contract, contract administration data. So this is like invoicing information. Um, gosh, let's see. Yeah, performance reporting, that sort of thing is in this section. So in this case, you need to be, um, they're gonna have you get registered in IPP, um, the invoice processing platform, which is common and used by some agencies. The Park Service is one of them. They tell you um, how they want your invoice to be submitted because you will be submitting a copy of your invoice through IPP. They want you to attach a copy of your invoice. And it needs to meet these specifications because if it doesn't, you could get, the invoice could get rejected and then that just delays your payment. So that's why you need to really pay attention to what they're asking for. Uh, let's see. Um, so IPP has changed a little bit. Some of you who, if you've done work for the Park Service or, or some other agencies, you may already be registered, which is great. You used to be able to register on your own, but now you can't do that. You have to be awarded a contract and the agency has to trigger, trigger the enrollment and you get an email that asks you to like finish the enrollment. So you can't do it yourself anymore. Um, they have to initiate it. And so that's just something to be aware of. Some I, I've noticed some contracting officers actually don't know that. Um, and it's not usually the contracting officer that initiates that. It's like someone, you know, someone like the BLM National Office, for example, is the one that, you know, initiates this. I found that recently, you know, for BLM, for BLM projects. So just keep that in mind. Um, you'll get the email. They have to initiate it on their end. Um, so this is... Um, talks about who is able to change the contract um, and who the contracting officer representative and what that, you know, what that definition is. So your contracting officer is the only one that can authorize any changes to, to your contract. You will be assigned a contracting officer representative when you work on a project like this, and they they're with you during the performance of the contract. They're kind of like a technical representative. And yes, they are a point of contact. And yes, you should communicate with them, especially if you ever see there's any changes that do need to be made. But that person cannot approve it. You have to go through the contracting officer to get any change orders approved, um, because a lot of times that might involve more money. Um, so don't rely on your contracting officer representative to, to get any changes done. You must go to the contracting officer, okay? That has been a problem with client. I've had a client that that was a problem. So just really keep that in mind, okay? And we don't have to go over all that in detail. So the other part of Section G is um, Contractor Performance Assessment Recording System. So in for this opportunity, the agency is going to do a CPARS on you, okay? So that's a, a rate, of, it's like a, a, a report, a report card for you. And they will, they'll write up their report card, they'll submit it in the system, and then you, you or somebody that you delegate within your business will get an email to um, respond to it and make comments. So you know, that's really important to know about this because you want to make comments about it, especially if they, if the agency makes kind of a negative comment about you, you need that you want to, you want to be able to go in here and speak to any of comments that they do make about you because it's on record and other agencies will use your CPARS report when looking at past performance history. So if you apply, if you submit an offer in the future, other than this project, the agencies are going to see your CPARs from this project and you want it to be, you want to have good marks with them. Um, let's see. Okay. So section H are special contract requirements. 
this is kind of like the section where where they put things that don't really fit anywhere else. So might be insurance information. In this case, there's lot there's lots of different things like pro prohibited ATVs because you're in a national park. Um, you know, these are all things that you need to be aware of because you don't. It's going to be part of your contract, so you don't want to you want to abide by it. You don't want to you don't want to make the agency mad. <laughs> Um, what else I saw in here? Oh yeah, oh, fire danger season, you know, that's because you're in a park. Uh, preservation of historical and archeological data. I've seen that in the solicitations for the park for even like BLM, some, some BLM opportunities to damage to utilities. So all, you, all these things you need to read and be aware of. And personnel, okay. Section I, now we're starting to get into lots of contract clauses. Again, I gave you the links to where the FAR can be found. So you can look up any of these clauses to read more about them. A lot of them are, are, are everyday things that you already abide by in your business. So do you have to read every single one of them in detail? Maybe not, but you know, you need to be at least aware of what they are and where they are and you know, where you can find the information and that's in the FAR. Um, I, you know, I made a note, like you're responsible for understanding these and, and as a general rule, if the clause is incorporated by reference, it's applicable. Um, there, some of the agency will include some clauses in full text. That also means they're applicable. And then there are some other clauses that are checkmarked or not, the ones that are checkmarked are the ones that are applicable. And we're gonna see those in just a minute. So all of these that are incorporated by reference are gonna be applicable to this solicitation, okay? This one is one that is in full text. So this one is, in, is applicable. So if you keep going, get to it. Oh, by American Act, I will come back to that. There are some down below, of course, now I can't find them, where they have a box and they have like an X in them. So anything that's checked, that has a check box next to it is applicable. Of course, now, now I can't find them. But let's talk about the Buy American Act because this does, this does I mean, it applies to the solicitation um, when in regarding construction materials. So, um you're they are they want you to use construction materials that are american made um if it is a commercially available off the shelf item or cots item the, um, that is an exemption from the buy american act okay so like your nails and screws you know those they're not gonna you don't those don't have to be american made okay but other things do and so if you have items like say you get maybe you get some lumber or something from Canada you have to disclose that information with your offer because what the agency will do it doesn't prohibit you from putting an offer but they will tack on a price penalty on those items which may potentially make your bid more expensive um, however in this case price isn't the only factor so that may not even matter at all in the end <laughs> but that's you know that's in a nutshell what they do with the buy american act is they they if it's out if it's manufactured outside the u.s you get a price penalty on those items okay and i've highlighted the areas they they talk about it here um you know you have to this is the information you have to provide to them we won't spend too much time on that. We probably could spend a lot more time on that because there's actually a lot more detail to it than that. And we'll keep going. These are more clauses, more clauses, more clauses. Okay. Oh, wait. So section J gives you a list of your documents and attachments. This one, I think, had a total of 10 attachments. I'm just going to quickly look at them. Uh, most of them were amendments. Um, like, for example, this is an, a copy of the amendment. If you scroll down, it um, talks about what the amendment is here. And so it tells you, tells you what it is. Provide site photos and answers to questions. Okay, so one of the amendments is the, the Q&A that was submitted. 
and there are some photos and we'll, I'll show you those in a second. This is also was is issued as um, an attachment. It's a justification for brand name products. And I think there's two of them in this case because they um, want you to use a specific brand of this electromagnetic flow meter. So they're, they're saying, we want this brand, you need to use this brand. Or if you have a subcontractor, you need to make sure your subcontractor is using this brand. And then same with this other attachment. So a different product, but this is the manufacturer they want you to use. Wage determination is the other was one of the other attachments. You know, these most of you I think are probably familiar with this, but this has your labor categories on it, and you need to be making sure that you're paying your late your your employees um, under the different labor categories the wages that are listed on here or higher so you don't want to be paying less than the wages that are on here um you can get in trouble from the department of labor and let's see i feel like i'm missing so let's see oh the past performance questionnaire yes so that's a, it's not a pdf so let me find it here. So one, uh, you know, one of the item and when we get to the instructions, you'll see it, you're going to have to submit past performance information. And this is called a past performance questionnaire. And you'll see in the instructions that we'll go over this, you're going to have to actually submit these to your references and have an instructor references to fill it out and send it directly to Stacy. Um, you don't want to, you do not want to submit these with your offer as filled out. Um, you will submit them with your offer, but not with all the information filled out. And I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about that when we go over the instructions. So um, that's one of the other attachments. And then here is the question and answer. So this is why it's important to ask questions ahead of time, because this is how the agency will, will provide the information to you and to others who are bidding. Um, so, and it's important because it'll help you as a bidder, um, you might have the same question. And so this, this could answer your question, you know, right away if you, you know, so you need to read it and, you know, it may impact how you respond to the offer. So um, here's some changes to some of the plans. You need to be aware of this and then the different Q and A that has gone off and some photos. So this is for your information and it's important to read through this as well. Let's see, da, 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 we went through all that. Okay, um, the plans, I'm not gonna open up that document. It's, it was just a list of like maps of the area, but it makes my computer go nuts. So I'm not gonna open it, I don't know why, but um, you, you, that document was provided to you. So you have the plans, you've got the maps and all of that. So keep going, section K, um, these are your reps and certs. Your reps and certs are, you do um, attest to those in your SAM registration. And sometimes agencies are just fine with you having an active SAM registration and they'll check it. Other times they actually want you to submit a document with your offer. And um, in this case they do. So we will we will talk about that. Um, a document, either your actual reps and certs from your SAM or just have you um, turn in one page from the solicitation that says your SAM is un and, and active. And let's see, so yeah, here it is. It's paragraph D applies. So, and we'll see this when we get to the instructions. They they want you to fill out, they want you to check this. If you're if you have a SAM registration and that it's active, you can attest to the reps and certs by marking this box and putting in your, they want your DUNS number and all that, and then like signing the page and turning it in with your offer. Okay, more clauses. We're getting close. Okay, here, these are the ones I was talking about. So like ownership or control and this clause here is marked with an X. So it applies to the solicitation. This one is not marked, so it's not, it doesn't apply. More reps and certs, this is telecommunications, also part of your SAM registration. Keep going, so we're almost through section K. We'll keep going. Um, here's more information on the Buy, Buy American Act. It's, it's kind of, it just discusses how they're going to evaluate those, um, any materials that are um, not domestic. Okay, section L, the very best section of all, the instructions. Yay, we're here. <laughs> 
Okay, more clauses at the top. So let's get down here to the, the guts of it. Service protests, I mean, I'm not gonna get into this, but they do tell you to reach out to, um, he's the contracting officer. All right, let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Okay, preparation of proposals. So when I talked about a template, this is where your template is gonna start to, to, to formulate, okay? Um, it, this part just, you know, is just saying this is, um, this RFP is governed by our part 15, um, you know, contract by negotiation. I gave you the link. Um, it talks about that there's going to be a trade-off process in the evaluation. So that means that they're not, it's not just like lowest price. They're taking other factors into consideration to get the, uh, who, to, to make a decision on who would, who would be able to provide the service that are more most advantageous to the government. So, um, you know, a trade-off process mean my, an example might be, you know, maybe one bidder has, maybe they have some like really specialized equipment or really specialized people that are working. Um, you know, so maybe the government says, okay, well, we'll spend a little more money for this other company. So we get these, the specialized, um, these specialized people. I don't know. That's just an example. You know, or maybe maybe somebody maybe one offer can get the work done sooner, and the government feels that that is in their best interest. So maybe that that could be something that they would in, consider in the trade off process. Um, you know, this talks that I highlighted this section because we did see a couple of discrepancies in the solicitation. So you need to um, tell Stacy about those. I highlighted this part because it says a proposal that merely reiterates or promises to accomplish the requirements of the RFP will be considered unacceptable. So that's really important. To, so when you're when you're writing your technical proposal and writing the information, you don't want to just state restate the scope of work or just say yes, we can do this and we've done it before. You know, they need more information. They need they need like a how. How are you going to do it? So don't just regurgitate what they are telling you. You have to make, provide more explanation than that. This award is going to be um, awarded without discussions, um, but reserves the right to hold discussions. Discussions might be, you know, for example, I had a client who is a janitorial firm. She was submitting an offer to, um, you know, to to an agency that was located in Missoula and she was one of the top choices and they needed a little more information from her on one aspect of her offer. So they reached out to her and asked her to provide some more information. So that would be an example of discussions. I don't know, Deanna, do you have anything else to add about that? I don't know, I don't, I don't have a ton of experience with that, but I did have that one, that one example, so. I'd have to think about that a minute, but that's exactly right. They they have the they just reserve that that option. Usually, it's for the purpose, like you said, of, of gathering more information or getting clarity. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we're starting to get into the actual submittal. Okay. Um, electronic volume shall be submitted as separate files. Okay. Um, so we'll uh, they want you to submit, I think, volume one and volume two in this case. Okay, so here's the very first part of your template, okay? They want a cover page. And we talked about at the beginning, a lot of times the standard form is used as a cover page, but not in this case. They want you to come up with your own cover page that includes this information, okay? So your name, your DUNS number, your contact information, a list of your subcontractors who you're gonna use, a uh, number of years the firm has been in business, um, acknowledgement that your SAM is active, um, and, um, and then acknowledgement that you're registered in IPP. This is kind of, this last part is, would be hard for someone who wasn't registered in IPP, but I kind of provide, a, you know, an example of what you might say in lieu of saying, yeah, we're registered in IPP. You might say, you know, we've never done in, you know, we've never had to invoice through IPP, but we will, um, you know, make sure and follow all instructions to get registered um, when the agency initiates the registration process. So 
Um, you can read that over here on your own. All right, so now we're gonna start to get into some more, these are even more details. So volume one, okay? So volume one is gonna be, that's gonna be like your, your first section, okay? So what I would do is I would have you like, you know, for example, would say your, your main heading might say volume one, okay? And then underneath it, you're gonna have list all your factors, okay? So you need to make sure that it's in Word or Adobe. You need, you know, this size of paper, no smaller than 10 point font, um, single spacing. And, you know, here it says no information shall prov be provided through references to websites. So what that means is do not say, visit our website at www.acmecorp.com to see the, to see um, a list of our services or to see what projects we've worked on in the past. That is a big no, do not do that. They will throw your proposal in the garbage, okay? Um, this is information about bid guarantees and um, how who to submit it to. So you're gonna submit your offer to Stacy, and then um, you're gonna submit your bid, um, hard copy bid guarantees to Eric, okay? So volume one has three factors under it, okay? so. Your main heading, like I said, volume one, and then underneath it, you're going to have different sections. So then you're going to say factor one, project experience, and then underneath that, you're going to start talking about your project experience. And then, then after that, you're going to factor two, past performance, and then underneath that, you're going to talk about your past performance and so on with factor three, okay? But the agency is telling you exactly the information that they want in each of these factors, okay? So factor one under uh, project experience, not to exceed 20 pages, so keep that in mind in that single space. Um, you know, they're telling you what you need, okay? You have to read through this and write to it, okay? They want, you know, they're, they're wanting you to submit information for projects that are similar in scope and magnitude and complexity, okay? So what past projects that have you done that are, um, that are the same or really similar to the scope of work here? And are they the same magnitude? The magnitude on this one was between a million and two million, okay? But if you have all only done projects that are really small, you know, less than a million, the agency may have a hard time um, being okay with your past experience. So they're just, they want to really make sure that your company is capable of doing the work and that you can complete the contract because they're spending taxpayer money on this, okay? Um, and I, I talk about that over here, you know, magnitude, um, you know, if your firm has never done any of this type of work, again, you might have a hard time convincing the agency that that you have. So um, it, it just you just really have to keep that in mind, okay? This is, you know, it's here it's gonna, it starts to really talk about the details too. So this is, they want you to um, provide a narrative about your experience in these types of working conditions in the wetlands, um, you know, involving, you know, permitting for the EPA. I mean, do you have that kind of experience? Can you write a comprehensive narrative that speaks to these items, okay? That is going to be convincing enough for the agency to choose you. So if you don't, again, if you don't have this type of experience, it, it might be hard to convince the agency that, that you are the best person for the job, okay? And keep in mind, like right here, the contractor shall have experience. So you need to pay attention to words like that. Shall, must, will. If it says those types of words, you, you have to do it, okay? It's, it's not, that is not gonna be negotiable, okay? That is what they're for sure looking for, okay? So then, you know, so once you start writing your narrative, you know, you're finished writing your narrative about your past project experience. And those guide sheets actually give you some good ideas for how to outline this out. So, you know, those will help you. Then you're gonna move on to past performance, okay? So this is where that past performance questionnaire is going to come into play. 
um, they want you to um, here they submit it to your references. So you're going to want to do that right away because who knows how long it's going to take those references to fill out the information and submit it directly to Stacy in this case. So if, if you make the decision, yes, I'm going to bid on this. I mean, I would get that those past performance questionnaires going right away because they need to be submitted to Stacy by the due date. And you don't want that to be late because then then you become your offer may become unresponsive. Stacy does say here she wants you to submit copies of the questionnaire that you forwarded to your reference with their point of contact information and they want you to submit that with volume one. So the way I read that is they actually want you to take one of those the past performance questionnaire and fill out the contact information for the reference and submit that in volume one. And then Stacy will get the full the full information from your individual references. Okay. And I mean, these are, and just also just keep in mind, these instructions are for this solicitation. This isn't how they're all going to be, okay? <laughs> so that's why you have to read these. Another reason why you have to read them. This was interesting to me. It says, submit a narrative disclosing any instances of past performance that may be considered less than fully satisfactory, describe pertinent facts, circumstances, etc." If you have past performance history that is less than fully satisfactory, I would say try not to submit it. But because they want recent past performance in the you know, similar scope and magnitude, you know, if your only option is to, to submit a reference that, you know, maybe was slightly less than satisfactory, then okay, fine, you have to do it. Um, so you just try not to, but be very clear about the situation that may have occurred for that specific past performance project. So. General rule, try not to do that, but if you have to, you know, make it look, word it, so word it in a positive light as much as possible, that's what I would, would say, and be true, still be truthful, obviously. And then we get into factor three, and this is your technical approach, management capability and schedule. So this is probably the hardest part, in my opinion, is because this is where you're going to actually talk about how you're going to do the work and how you're going to do it per the scope of work and the evaluation criteria actually too. Um, we'll get to the evaluation criteria, but you'll notice if you you know that the you'll notice things in the evaluation criteria that that they will require as part of your submittal. So you you need to read the evaluation criteria um, and the scope of work obviously too. But when you're writing your technical part you need to speak to both the evaluation criteria and the scope of work. You need to make sure you're covering it all. Um, what else? Let's see, I just have to look at my notes. Okay, we've already talked about that. You don't wanna regurgitate the scope of work. So you don't wanna say things, oh yeah, we can do this. You wanna tell them how, talk about your methods, you know, talk about who's doing what and you know what equipment is going to be used to do xyz part of the project you know you that's what you're that's what they want from you because they want to know again that you can do the work uh let's see the submitted proposal must clearly describe and demonstrate the offers capabilities and approach to you know these these items so um you know one way to you know some things to think about um uh, let's see you know, here you might use these as subheadings under this factor. So you might have say factor three, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then you say subheading A is critical personnel and then you talk about it. And then B capabilities and then you talk about it. That's just an example. You could use these as subheadings too. Um, you know, what? who is your critical personnel? So let's talk about that for a second. Who's your critical pers personnel and what will their role be in the project? Um, you know, job site managers, engineers, what are they doing? How are, you know, what is their role? What are, what are they specifically doing on this project? You know, what are they going to bring to the table here? How, you know, how, and how does that um, make you better than anybody else? What are their capabilities, their background, their education, qualifications, et cetera? 
you know, and you'll provide some of that, you know, up above too, but you know, you can talk about it here as well. They want you to come up with a timeline and milestones. You have to submit, you know, an idea of, you know, what part of the project you're going to be doing first, second, third, how long is it going to take you? You know, you want to include some dates of, you know, these major, of major milestones um, in the project. And, you know, I'm not in the construction industry, but, you know, reading the scope of work will help you determine that. So definitely use the scope of work to help gauge what that timeline would look like. Um, let's see, write a narrative about the approach and strategy of how you will complete this project, the methods, we've talked about that. You know, how do you check or guarantee for quality? How do you, um, you know, how do you check that the system that you're proposing is, is safe? You know, the, those are some things that they're going to want in this in this in this proposal. So then we get to volume two. So okay, so you've got volume one, and you got three factors underneath it. That's your template. And then the other part is volume two. So again, you're going to have volume two, and then underneath that, you're going to um, you're going to have these other items. So then you're going to submit your standard form fourteen forty two with these sections filled out, which we've already talked about. Um, then you're going to have fill out that bid schedule that is in um, that you saw on section B um, that has your fully burden rate. Okay. And let's see. Uh, oh, and then here's your reps and certs. So uh, I, I have to go back to it, but I mentioned that page where it said paragraph D applies. This is what they're talking about. And they want your DUNS number and your tax ID number on that page. And you would turn it in with volume two. So, okay, yeah, so that's the end of volume two. And then your evaluation factors. So this is, that's what section M is. And you want to be aware of how they're gonna evaluate you. Um, because, well, like I said, you're gonna be, you wanna use some of this information when you're putting together your narrative and you, you wanna know, well, how are they gonna be, um, what's the basis for award, which we have already talked about, it's best value trade-off process is how they're gonna be evaluating you. Uh, evalu all evaluation factors other than cost or price when combined are approximately equal to cost or price. Um, that's just, I just highlighted that for you. Um, let's see. Here we go. So here's the factors. Okay, so project experience. So, you know, they're gonna, so these are the specific things they're looking for in factor one. Um, so you really need to make sure that you're including this information and that you're providing enough information for them to evaluate you you know, excellent or good at least. Excellent would be would be the best. So I mean, I'm not going to read through it, but you know, you can see this is what they're they want you to demonstrate. And then same with factor two, this is what they're what they're looking for in your past performance. And factor three, this is what they're really going to be looking for in evaluating um, with on your what in your narrative that you're going to be writing. Volume two, is, the evaluation for volume two is a little easier because, I mean, you're just submitting the, the 1442, your pricing, um, and the, your reps and search. So you have to submit it, but if you forget one of those documents, then you could be deemed to be unresponsive and they might not even look at your proposal. So even though volume two is easier, you still need to make sure that it's done and it's done correctly. And that's it. No big deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of information. Um, I think I just think I would want to take questions because I think that helps everybody. And um, I can go over any of this again right now. I can go back and look at anything. So feel free to ask questions. Don't be shy. And Deanna, if you have anything else to add, yeah. feel free. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I would say, I, uh, first of all, awesome, awesome information, Roz, awesome job. This is no, this is um, a pretty heavy lift here. I mean, this is a complicated RFP here. And so 
it's a great example. And they're going to vary in complexity from from this, depending on what you do, of course, in your industry. But it's a daunting writing exercise, frankly. And you know what we see in our experience sometimes that's the hardest part for companies is you know doing the the writing that is going to be persuasive enough for the agency to be assured that you know what you're doing <laughs> and so what i would say is you know it's easy for companies to usually understand the scope of work oh yeah we can do that we can do that but then pulling all this other information together and the descriptions is more difficult and i would say don't be overwhelmed by it though. I, I would say start with a section at a time. And I always say, write a, a, a draft, use, the, use their words and their titles and subtitles as prompts and, and start to formulate a draft around those sections and those words. And it doesn't have to be perfectly written the first time. Uh, sometimes it's an, an interesting thing when you start to write how if you just formulate a draft and start just putting some things you know down on a word document uh, eventually and then you go back to that section you go back to the draft and then you can start to develop more formal structure around the sentences and the description and you really do make progress when you do it that way you know but if you say well start at the beginning and um <laughs> you know you don't, you end up not starting so I, I do think you just have to start and and you know maybe tackle the, the more difficult sections first and work on a little bit of a little bit at a time maybe if possible you know split up some of the sections within your company and then come back it needs to be in the same voice though so one person eventually needs to pull it together yeah. and and make sure everything that you go through it but um, it's a it's a great learning experience if you haven't done it before it's not easy you know and i think paying attention to the go and no go to start with is is, is helps i just met with a company yesterday as a matter of fact they spent a week on an rfp and Roz stressed this earlier pay attention to the instructions well, they spent a week and, and did a bang up job on all of it, except the pricing. They didn't follow the instructions for the pricing. Their, their pricing model at their particular company didn't really fit into what the agency wanted. And so they didn't fully understand that that's not optional. <laughs> if your pricing model doesn't fit into what they're asking for, then you shouldn't even bid on that project if you can't make the conversion. And so, so they were considered to be unresponsive uh, in their RFP response because, because they couldn't put the pricing in, in the form that the agency asked it for it. And so that was a hard lesson because they, a lot of time went into it. And so, um, you know, they won't make that mistake again. Sometimes we all have to learn the hard way, but I would say the go, no go is, is the first thing, but then, um, and, and, you know, we're here to help you kind of sort some of this out and work through it. We can be a second set of eyes and give you feedback. You know, we're not obviously able to write a proposal for a company, but we we can usually, you know, we're putting the the reader's hat on. And so that can sometimes help you be, and I would say do that too. Put your, think about the reader and, and how is this information going to be perceived or received by the by the reader and what if you were the reader would you know what this company was talking about would you have confidence and those are the questions i would be asking myself and so i guess that's that's what i have yeah and here are just some top 10 tips and we've talked about a lot of them but and these slides are available to you in that dropbox but um Definitely don't wait until the last minute and pay attention yeah. to the date and time because if you just don't even have enough time to put this together, it's going to be a lot of stress for yeah. I mean, no reason. Just get the next one, you know. Yep. I, I don't know. And and if you need our help, we definitely need enough time to review the solicitation That's and, right. and your your submittal. So we have to have enough time to review all of it and get enough, and get feedback to you so that right. you have enough time to submit it. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You gotta, you gotta you gotta keep that in mind and so you have to get notice of these opportunities and be looking for them because if you're not getting notice of the opportunities in enough time then you're already you're already behind <laughs> so absolutely yeah 
And yeah, so questions. Let's see. There's some in the something in the chat here. Um, let's see. Okay, if you are a new company and have limited contracting work, can you use an individual's or your management's previous experience in your past performance for the RFP? Um, yeah, um, you can. Um, I'm trying to think, what do you think is the best way to present that, Deanna? Yeah, I, I would make it very clear because because your company is the one responding to the particular opportunity and so they're what they're asking for does your company have experience but you know there are examples where obviously in a in, you know in a professional realm you know you're an engineer and you worked for a company for 35 years and you did lots of similar work for that company then you started your own engineering firm you still have all that experience and that knowledge and that professional training, but you'd have to make make it very clear that your company doesn't have the past performance, but you has has the owner and the professional have the the past performance, mm -hmm. and um, and sometimes past experience isn't a, you know doesn't suffice. Sometimes you have to actually just go get that experience as a company, maybe on smaller opportunities or subcontracting opportunities. You know, what we're talking about today is an RFP. That's the most complicated, most involved type of uh, solicitation out there. They're usually over 250,000 and over is, is, you know, the, and up is the threshold. I mean, this was one to 2 million. So, you know, maybe work on some smaller opportunities, some RFQs, those are gonna be below the simplified acquisition threshold of 250,000 you know, per the FAR. And those don't require quite as much information as this yet. It could be still very good uh, experience and past performance. And so maybe start a little smaller, maybe state or local opportunities as opposed to a full blown federal RFP right out of the gate, <laughs> you know, that, that will help. Yeah. that will help so with for a newer company that has you know limited experience um let's see okay when is the ideal time frame to submit on the due date within five days of the deadline anytime after the question responses have been made available or other um i don't think it's really an i the ideal time frame is to make sure it's on time and not late <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say there's an ideal as long as it's not late, because if it's late, then they, you're, it's not going to get looked at. You're out. You're yeah. out. So. Yeah. And I've seen it happen, though, where companies submitted early. They did a great job being early, but then an amendment got made. They submitted it five days early, and then on the day seven, an amendment got made. And so then they have to <laughs> not resubmit necessarily, but they have to scramble to make sure they're acknowledging that amendment. And so, you know, I, I'm definitely not a fan of waiting until the last minute. I think there's, there, you have to consider, can there be technical problems with the method they've asked you to submit? I, I didn't remember what it said in here. I think it was email actually, was email. Yeah. the CO, but sometimes you have to submit through an electronic system. There's one called Fed Connect that sometimes you have to actually submit through that. Uh, Department of Interior uses that system sometimes. So, yeah, don't wait till the last minute, but you know, maybe not, uh, maybe a week. Uh, things can change in a few days. Yeah. So keep your eyes on it, even if you've submitted it. And some, I mean, I have seen them still once in a while. They do want you to mail them. Yeah. Um, that is going to logistically, you have to think about that because if it has to go somewhere to the East Coast or wherever, <laughs> You know, you need to make sure it gets to them by the date and their time, you know, if it's 4 p.m. or, you know, whatever, their time, you need to make sure it gets there, so. Yeah, I helped a company last summer. They put in a uh, response to a solicitation for uh, hospital gowns and for, um, I think it was, I don't remember if it was for the CDC or might have been for FEMA, actually. But anyway, I mean, they had to literally mail samples of their of their gowns to somewhere back east but it it had to arrive during you know some working hours and they were closed during lunch and there were all these restrictions you know and I thought wow I don't know and you know she got it there but she had to be thinking ahead and planning for that yeah yep for sure 
What other questions? Um, and I know Deanna said this, but you know, yes, this one is really complicated. They're not all this complicated, um, and not and not everything's an RFP. So there's RFQs out there too. But I've noticed a lot of RFQs have actually yeah. do want a component, a technical proposal. Yeah. Yep. So even even if it's a simple RFQ, you still may be required to do some writing. Gotcha. <laughs> so. Anything else? Don't be shy, you guys. You're being so quiet. Has anybody has anybody ever submitted an RFP in the past, whether it's through the government or you know, even private sector or state, state government? Formal RFP? No. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I mean, we're here to help. So yep. Um, we're here to help and answer questions and you know I think I really do like those guide sheets and you know yeah I, I think they will help you get you thinking yep absolutely so if there aren't any questions I can let you go are we early what time is it uh so yeah a little early a little early okay Seven fifteen. yeah Roz is going to send out a survey after this electronically if you would be so kind as to reply we appreciate that feedback and we use it to make our workshops better for you in the future. And uh, stay tuned, we're having some more workshops. Make sure you're checking our website and we'll send out notices obviously if you've worked with us, but there's a pretty specialized accounting workshop coming up mm -hmm. for federal contracts in April. And we have an expert from Ohio on to do that workshop uh, with us and some other tips and tricks for finding opportunities and marketing your company to government buyers. That's coming up. I don't remember all the dates, but montanaptac.org under the event tab. And uh, so keep your eyes out and yeah. Okay. Also, thanks for signing on. Yeah. Thank you guys all so much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again in the future and you reach out if you have questions as we're here to help and we like to help. Yep. Enjoy your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.